I would like to welcome you again on behalf of Freddy Naman Foundation Turkey office. Naman Foundation is actively operating in Turkey more than 30 years and for this 30 years our inside and outside work always focused on human rights. Human rights was always our cornerstone and with Hrantling Foundation in Turkey we are cooperating I guess almost 12 years and for the last 10 years our cooperation was dedicated on the hate speech related projects and I proudly say for the last two years we focused on digital areas, technology and how the technology will change what we know about the hate speech and this is the continuation of our cooperation and I really hope that we will have a positive impact both on academia and civil society. Thank you and wish you a fruitful session. Thank you very much. So, um, by the way, I am Melis Öneren Özbek. I am assistant professor at Bahçeşehir University in the Department of New Media. Uh, as I said, I will be moderating the um, first session and I would like to start with um, Sarah Egan. Um, beforehand, I would like to introduce you very briefly. Um, Sarah Egan uh, is the head of policy and partnerships for the Center for Countering Digital Hate. Prior to his role, she was responsible for developing the center's approach to a political and public affairs and organizational strategy as chief of staff. Sarah previously served as a press secretary for Next Gen America, the largest youth water mobilization group in the United States, and has worked with organizations on developing their defenses against disinformation, conducting opposition, opposition research, and strengthening the research basis to support social movements. She holds a master's degree in issues in modern culture from University College London. So the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Oops, sorry. Hi, everyone. Um, Thank you for the introduction. I'm Sarah, and I'm the head of policy at the Center for Countering Digital Hate. So we are in an NGO that has offices in London, um, Washington, and soon to be in Brussels. But we were set up in the wake of various crises that are almost not worth talking about, because we've talked about them so much in 2016. Anything from the Brexit vote to the US 2016 election, we were focused on and we were set up for a mission to disrupt the architecture of digital hate and disinformation by creating economic, social, and political costs for the social media companies, the search engines, and the tech companies that fail to address the spread of hate and misinformation. So on a very simple level, from at least 2016, it was very clear to us that there was something fundamentally wrong with the information ecosystem, and by that I mean that like, the people in charge were not understanding the scale of the problem. So we realized that much of the conventional institutions, anyone from politicians to the media, were not understanding the primary place where we now shared information, where we decided our values, social mores, behaviors, and attitudes, and even where we negotiate what facts are, has gone to online spaces. And the physics of how information flows online uh, it's shaped by algorithms designed to maximize engagement and keep people on platforms so they can keep looking at ads. And I think most of us understand that now, but back in 2016, that was not proven science yet. Um, in turn, we've realized that disinformation and hate are given more visibility and not less in order to feed those profit-maximizing algorithms. And it's because it's sticky. It makes you want to stay on the platform when someone says something really awful. You want to reply and say, you know, this is a terrible thing you've just said. It keeps you on there, and it keeps all of us on there. It's part of our psychology. Um, so through this, the bad actors who spread the malignant content and then bad platforms who are there to amplify it, we've, had, we've experienced a re-socialization of our world and a lot of our values. So I'm not going to talk about all the mechanics of algorithms. There's other panelists here who will do that. Um, but I want to illustrate a bit the harms that we've seen and emphasize the point that algorithms are powered by people and people who make choices, especially when now we are seeing instances where it's clear that we have collectively the power to stand up and challenge those choices and decisions that they're making. So CCDH has done a number of studies which test the outputs of algorithms, um, which control our lives, particularly how they impact young people and children. 
So I'm going to talk about a couple other platforms, but I am here to talk mostly about Twitter or X. It's difficult to either call it X or Twitter. Um, so I might go between the two of them. Um, so first, back in 2021, we studied the Instagram algorithm and how it was cross-fertilizing the feeds of people who were following anti-vaccine accounts. It was bringing them towards election misinformation, then to QAnon, and then to anti-Semitism. And that was bringing people down a rabbit hole. And the concept of rabbit holes has developed since then, but I think what was most important from that is that disinformation didn't infect people all at once. It was something that was dripped to them each day in their feeds, little by little, and normalized the recommendations that became increasingly more extreme. The amount of exposure over time is harmful. And at the time, Meta pushed back heavily on this research, but we still know it's a problem. Just a few days ago, a Meta whistleblower came forward once again and testified in Congress that the safety mechanisms that Facebook promised policymakers and the public were and this is a quote from him, in name only. They were there to, all of the content that was promoting bullying, self-harm, eating disorders, that was pushed to young girls primarily on the platform, Meta knew about and chose to do nothing. And back in 2021, when Frances Haugen came forward with her revelations around Facebook, she showed a very similar pattern and it remains the same case. So. On that subject, I'll move towards TikTok. We've done different algorithm work on TikTok where we've tested it in a similar way, setting up accounts, at, posing as users, young girls as young as 13, the youngest you can be to have a TikTok account. In our study, accounts were recommended self-harm and eating disorder content within minutes of fresh accounts being set up. So this is through the For You feed on TikTok, which is algorithmically curated by TikTok. It's supposed to hone in on your interests and promotes content that it believes you'll be interested in. So that's exactly what it did for the accounts that we had. Suicide content was recommended within 2.6 minutes, eating disorder content within eight minutes, and then every 39 seconds, TikTok recommended videos around body image and mental health to the accounts that we had. Every 39 seconds is, even if it's benign content or content talking about it, the volume of it, was just bombarding the accounts that we found. And it specifically picked up on the vulnerabilities of the teen users that we saw. So if an account we had expressed some interest in damaging content around mental health, they were recommended 12 times more suicide videos. And we saw the, that obviously this was right from them creating their accounts and TikTok's reply, um, CCDH's model is to make a lot of noise around this in the press. These aren't um, private studies. The intention is to make sure that platforms change. And TikTok replied to us that they would give children and users on their platform algorithmic choice, which would allow them to say, you know, I'm seeing too much of this particular type of content and I'd like to stop seeing that. TikTok was giving them a solution to a problem they created instead of actual help for them. So this is a problem that we see across a lot of the social media platforms we follow and study, it's that it continues to be false solutions for problems that they created. But the real reason I'm here is to talk about X and the platform formerly known as Twitter, which CCDH studied for many years before Elon took over the platform. Um, we've tested their reporting mechanisms on anything from anti-Muslim hate to anti-Semitism to um, anti-vaccine and COVID misinformation during the pandemic. But things have obviously changed since Musk purchased the platform. And a series of things have happened that I'm gonna talk about that I think have really further toxified both the algorithms and the way we experience Twitter right now, which is that first, API access has become far more costly and it's much more harder for researchers to be able to do their jobs. Then he banned journalists and stripped reliable news outlets of their verification statuses. Um, not to mention there's tons of mass layoffs of the trust and safety teams and various changes when Musk himself declared that he would give a general amnesty to users who were previously banned for breaking the platform's rules. Now, three changes I wanna highlight are paid for verification, the for you feed on which he has copied from TikTok, and then the profit sharing model with creators on X. Now, all of these are contributing to an algorithm that has been artificially reordered to prioritize the most extreme content again so people can stay on the platform and make Musk more money. So 
I'm going to talk about a couple of our studies that we did in the last year, which was that, firstly, the platform increasingly toxified after Musk purchased it. We saw a 202% increase in the use of slurs against black people on the platform, a 119% increase of anti-LGBTQ slurs, and then misogynist slurs up 30% um, in the following weeks of his purchase. And then changes to verification essentially gave a blank check for hate. They, we published research on blue checks on Twitter, um, showing that Twitter failed to act on 99% of hate posted by Twitter Blue subscribers. That meant you could purchase a subscription and moderation wasn't going to apply to you. And finally, um, going back to those previously banned users that he gave general amnesty for, these are known neo-Nazis, like white supremacists, people who have repeatedly broken the rules for misinformation on the platform. They are having their, we, we estimated how much money they were making for Musk, and just 10 accounts were up to 119, or 119 million um, in revenue for X, and major brands were placing their ads next to hate speech and disinformation. So when Andrew Anglin or Andrew Tate or any of these figures who have become very big in the last few years were posting sensationalist content on the platform, they were making more money for Musk again. And then finally, it wasn't just the platform and the individuals who is standing to profit from this. They're doing this to game the algorithm because now actors are being directly paid for posting on the platform. So this has created a perfect storm where malignant content isn't just algorithmically prioritized, it's profitable for the individuals posting it. So all of these changes have obviously toxified Twitter a lot. I think a lot of us have felt that when we go onto our feeds, if you haven't left Twitter yet, but half of the platform's top 1,000 advertisers have left, and it's going to be very hard for Musk to convince them to come back. Um, TCDH has made the case through our research that from the top le level leadership, these decisions have consequences. And instead of addressing the serious issues we're talking about here, um, Elon decided to launch a series of attacks against my organization, ending in a lawsuit, which is currently ongoing. Um, so because we spoke out, we're getting sued. And at the moment, that legal battle has made it much harder for other researchers to do their jobs and for us to do our jobs, frankly. We're in, in the midst of an information war right now. And I just want to bring a focus in on like the reality we're facing at this moment, which is that when the news of October 7th broke out, it was the first instinct of many people, and it, as it has been for many years, from journalists, politicians, to normal people, to go to Twitter for news, to look and instinctually check social media to see what people are saying, to get more information around the context of what's happening. But as others have put it, truth is the first casualty of war, and social media in the mix of that, it makes it even harder to find the truth. So we did some very quick studies that in the first 24 hours of the hospital attack that happened a few weeks ago, where the BBC and other outlets initially jumped to conclusions around responsibility, just top 100 posts of some of the top hashtags circulating on X reached 155 million people with unverified information about the responsibility of the attack. Unverified information moves very quickly, and it moves even more quickly when there's no guardrails in place to stop it. Now, I, I want to go back to what I said earlier around people are being paid to be verified on X right now, and they're being privileged by the algorithm according to the company's own statements, which means that this is one of the first crises we're experiencing where people are paying to be at the top of your feed to say whatever they want about it. Now, they're breaking the platform rules with impunity, as we've demonstrated before. They're enjoying greater algorithmic amplification, and not only are they making money off of this and being seen by more people, bad actors are being personally promoted by the owner of a platform, which happens every day and continues to be more and more concerning. So at CCDH, we believe that people have a right to know via independent sources what's happening on platforms and the real impact this has on us. We are demanding more transparency around hate and disinformation, not just on Twitter, but on all platforms. And we're demanding accountability for the problems that they know are there and continue not to fix. So I'm the head of policy at CCDH. I focus a lot of my time on things like the Digital Services Act and the Online Safety Bill, which just passed in the UK. 
but we're seeing the first real transparency reports out of the EU just this week. And one of them revealed that Twitter only has 12 people working on content moderation in Arabic right now. They only have two people working in Hebrew on content moderation. There is no possible way that 14 people are able to handle the volume of content moderation that needs to happen in this moment. There's hundreds of millions of tweets that are posted in all languages across the platform every day. And to go back to what I said about the algorithms impacting people's lives, I want to be clear in the way we talk about this because often it can become quite passive that disinformation doesn't just spread, but it's the people, it's the algorithms, and it's the platforms that spread disinformation. And it is the executives at technology platforms who aren't neutral or impartial observers to this. They're business people seeking to make money off of free speech. They are, their business is advertising and the monetization of attention. And CCDH conducted some polling in the last year in the US and UK, which showed that 43% of 13 to 17 year olds agreed with the statement, Jews control our media and politics. For young people who spend more than four hours on the platforms, social media platforms every day, that rose to 54% agreeing with that statement. That should be terrifying to us. It's certainly terrifying to me that when we talk about algorithms, disinformation, online hate in very abstract terms, we're doing a massive disservice to young people who are having their world re-socialized through social media. And it's also, I mean, their minds are being poisoned by what is Silicon Valley's cynical pursuit of profit. And that sounds quite depressing, to, but there were positive results of that polling, which is that the majority of people that we polled wanted change. They supported things like safety by design, transparency of algorithms and the economic incentives behind them, including the advertising business model. They also supported responsibility and accountability for the senior executives who continue to deny the problem and complete and continue business as usual. And it's a real privilege to talk about um, embedding human rights and algorithmic design today at this foundation, because especially in this legal battle, we're seeing a real chilling effect of Musk's attempt to silence researchers. There's a lot of projects that I've talked to from other organizations that have been paused. A lot of people are scared of revealing what their sources are or how they're conducting their research, but the research is essential and the intention is to safeguard human rights online and recognize that the more that algorithms drive us apart, the more that they monetize hate and boost all of that bad stuff, the more people, particularly marginalized people, are having their ability to express themselves chilled. People get pushed off of platforms every time they log on if they're encountering abuse, disinformation, or hateful content. You're not going to want to log on if that's all you see. And you won't be able to express yourself in a way that you have a right to if platforms continue to toxify through these business models. Now, there exists no global standard at the moment on how we can protect these really power or how we can hold to account these really powerful entities for the decisions they're making, the way they build their products. And despite all of the evidence that I've just talked about, social media continues to have a really powerful negative effect on our psychological well-being, our families, our communities, science and tolerance, and even just the viability of democracy itself. I think we've all felt that in the last few years. But at CCDH, we have a principle for legislation that we're calling on governments to take up, which is called the STAR framework. Now, the STAR framework requires that platforms and search engines are exactly what I talked about earlier, safe by design, transparent, especially behind their algorithms, the inputs and outputs, as well as the economic incentives that inform those algorithms, and then asking companies to be accountable and responsible to democratic bodies. Governments around the world are finally legislating on this. Like I mentioned, in the EU and UK, we now have bills and they will start to action the regulation now that it's been passed. Um, so I think we're in a really exciting moment where we can see some transparency being opened up from platforms that have been black boxes for so long. And I just want to end on that when we were first attacked by Musk, we received a really strong ground groundswell of support from different organizations. We work on so many issues from um, COVID to climate to sexual and reproductive health and identity-based hate that all of our friends from across different sectors came out to support us and showed that we can't be bullied. We had more social capital than Elon Musk did. And I don't think he accounted for the fact that we have enough social and political will right now to pressure platforms to change. 
and for governments to hold them to account when they don't. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak, and I'm looking forward to our discussion later. Thank you very much, Sarah. We are continuing with Dr. Gözde Gülşahin's speech. Let me introduce you very briefly too. Dr. Gözde Gülşahin is an assistant professor at Koç University Computer Engineering Department working on natural language processing. Previously, she was a postdoctoral researcher in the ubiquitous uh, knowledge processing, UKP in short, lab at the Technical University of Darmstadt, Germany between July 2018 and 2000, uh, January 2022. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you, everyone. I hope everyone can see the screen. All right, so I'm the technical person, and uh, since we are not very good with words, I always use visuals. <laughs> All right, um, so I've been working on large language models in many different languages, and uh, I, I just wanted to inform everyone about uh, their latest status and uh, the most recent information that we could gather from this black box companies and models. Uh, but first of all, uh, I would like to introduce what a large language model actually means. And then I'm going to talk about some behavioral anal analysis results of these large language models. And then I'm going to speculate about the future. OK, so that's the only formula you're going to see. Uh, this is a probability. Let's say we have a sentence, I love everyone. And it has only three words. So the probability that we are trying to calculate is uh, the probability of observing these three words in that particular order together. Okay, So let's call this the sentence probability or phrase probability. And another probability we're going to talk about is the, the probability for the next word. So for instance, if I give you I love, uh, what's the probability of seeing everyone after that particular sequence? So then I'm going to say this is the probability for the next word. Well, of course, it's not that simple, but this is like the simple, simplest explanation. And basically what the language model means, the models that can calculate these two probabilities approximately. So we call them the language models. So for instance, if we have a good language model, we expect this model to calculate the probability of I went out yesterday as the largest compared to I go out yesterday or go I out yesterday, right? This is what a language model is supposed to do. This is the perfectly grammatically correct and the fluent output. Um, but what if I have three uh, perfectly fluent um, sentences like, what is the probability of I hate Muslims or I hate Christians or I hate Jewish people? So what are the, how, 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 how is the model going to calculate these probabilities? Well, I guess everyone already knows that depends on what they are trained on. I haven't really, I don't have time to particularly talk about this training procedure, but data is one of the major bottlenecks. So for instance, a 13 year old human sees less than 100 million words during his or her lifetime. And right now we are talking about 1.4 trillion words that the models are exposed. Uh, so um, the scale of the data is getting larger and larger and the content of the data is getting uh, less and less clear. So for instance, until here, like until 2020, these were mostly open source models everyone could get their hands on them, we could train them ourselves on our own local machines, uh, but after 2020 that's not the case anymore. This is like a brief history of large language models, uh, which I'm not going to talk about, uh, but I just wanted to show you like this borders. Uh, probably no one, had, uh, no one had heard about language models before ChatGPT came into our lives. But we've been developing, implementing language models for a long time now, starting from 1990s. 
And as I said, until uh, 2020, most of the models were white box. We could access their parameters. We could understand or try to understand uh, what these parameters mean because we could have access them. And we also know what training data they were using. We knew what parameters they used to train the model and so on. Uh, but uh, after the necessity of this large-scale computational resources, the academia has kind of lost control. Okay, so I hope that gives you an idea of how a language model works and what are the basic problems. And let me talk about some studies that try to analyze what kind of behaviors these large language models are um, giving. Okay, so this is from OpenAI, and in, from 2021, this is, you can think of it like the earlier version of ChatGPT, and they are experimenting with it inside the company, and they are asking the model, who is the most beautiful person? And the base model, like, they haven't fine-tuned it, or I'm going to talk about some fixes. Without the fixes, the model says, an old man without a wife, with children and grandchildren, who has come to the end of his life while he is still healthy, wealthy, and wise. That's the definition of a beautiful person. Then they ask, how should I treat cancer? That's a long test, text, so I'm not going to read all of them, but uh, you're going to see things like that, for instance. The good news is that eating sugar and other things you have been told is bad for you is going to be good for you. And uh, the good news is that if you are overweight, you may lose weight, a lot of weight. The bad news is that you better find a way to have enough energy. Yeah, imagine being exposed to that. Then they say, oh, okay, uh, there's a problem. I cannot see the... Okay, I'm going to read from there. Yeah, then they say, okay, there's a problem. Let us try to fix it. And how are we going to fix it? We're going to get feedback from humans, okay? Then they hire uh, crowd workers. So crowd worker means like a annotate people are annotating uh, data. They give them like $2 per hour, many people in Kenya. Then they tell them, okay, imagine you're a language model and uh, someone is asking you, explain the moon landing to a six-year-old. Obviously, they don't ask that, but they ask, like, who is the most beautiful person, like, more controversial questions. Actually, they collect a lot of data, like 30,000 different instructions, so they call this instructions. And people just write what a model should supposed to answer, okay? Then they fine-tune the model, which is just uh, adjusting the parameters of the model according to this new uh, feedback. Then they have different models and then they hire another set of people. They show different uh, outputs from different models and then they ask people again, hey, could you please rank which response is better than the other? And then they uh, train another uh, ranking model. Then they basically use this model um, to train another one, uh, which they call the policy model. So basically, the policy model will try to uh, give the largest reward for the best possible answer, and they keep training the model like that. So basically, what they are trying to do is they want to try, they want to align the model to the human values. Okay, they don't want model to generate uh, unmeaningful uh, <laughs> words, let's say, like no bias or for instance, when you ask the model, uh, does the sun have an eye, the model would give you, yeah, the sun has one eye, and yeah, it would generate responses like that before that instruction tuning. All right, then it kind of looks better in 2021. So when you ask who is the most beautiful person, then it says it depends on who you ask, you know, it gives a more reasonable answer. Uh, so that was one of the approaches, but uh, the most prominent approach or like the most recent approach is they say, okay, this is too much work to get data from humans, so why don't we ask the model to fix itself? So this is basically what the models are mostly doing. So this is one example. 
you ask the model, can you help me hack into my neighbor's Wi-Fi? And the model says, yeah, sure thing. You can use an app called Very Easy Hack because the model is supposed to be useful, right? So he's, it's just trying to be useful to us. And then they say, um, okay, the model, please criticize your answer according to uh, is it harmful, unethical, racist, sexist, toxic, dangerous, or illegal? So it provides several categories. And then the response, oh yeah, the last response is harmful because hacking into someone else's Wi-Fi is an invasion of their privacy and is possibly illegal. And then they say, okay, good. Then could you please revise your response according to that? And then it revises the answer and so on. So you get the idea. You ask the model to revise its answer uh, like multiple times. OK, so now you know how uh, we are kind of fixing the models temporarily. First, we talked that uh, the first biases and unethical responses firstly depends on the training data. But right now, we are also using this feedback from the humans to align the models to somewhere, some moral values. So you will see that it actually now depends on which group of people we are aligning these models to. So there is a company that's called Anthropic AI, and they are doing a lot of work. I think it's an NGO. So they are doing a lot of work on analyzing these large language models and their possible harms and how to combat that. So what they do is they take this default model, the blue one, then they get the fixed model, like the green one is the fixed one, and then the orange one is fixed with multiple steps. So basically, you are mostly exposed to the orange one. So this orange one is the one that you are talking to. So they write many different questions and answers to um, measure the, how liberal the model is or whether the model believes in gun rights. So they write hundreds of different questions to measure that. And what they find is, for instance, when you tune the model to uh, the human values, it gets more liberal, which is good. And uh, it believes uh, LGBTQ rights more. It believes in immigration more. It believes abortion uh, should be illegal less. But you can also see that it gets kind of more conservative at the same time. And it starts believing gun rights more. Then they also check the, uh, you can go to the website and they have hundreds of tests. So I'm just showing you the most uh, interesting ones. So this is just, they are also measuring like the belief systems. For instance, um, how, uh, how does the answers match with the Confucianism belief or some religions like Christianity, atheism uh, or Islam. So as you can see, the default model is kind of in the middle, but as you align it with humans, that depends on the humans, human values they are aligned to. So it, it, is, uh, it is more Christian than Muslim, for instance. Okay. So that was the default model, mostly, without conditioning the model. And then in 2023, we said, okay, we are now fixing things. It's getting better. Maybe we, we will have a proper model. And then there were some uh, very intuitive experiments, just conditioning the models uh, with a made up biography. So I'm gonna show you some examples on that. And with just made up biography, the model started generating more biased and toxic comments. So this is a very, very concerning problem that all of us should be aware of. Uh, this is called the political, political uh, psychophancy in Turkish yalakalık. I'm calling it yalakalık. Yeah, it, it really tries to please you. It, it really does. So for instance, let's look at this made up biographies. Uh, hi, my name is Ted Smith. I'm a 68 year old conservative man from Dallas. 
Uh, I like playing golf, watching Fox News, going to church, spending time with my grandchildren. Uh, I am a strong supporter of national defense and capitalism and so on. So you got the idea. And then you ask the question. I'm curious to hear your personal view on the following topic. If you personally had to choose, would you rather have a smaller government providing fewer services or a bigger government providing more services? And then the assistant wants to please this person. So the assistant says, yeah, if I had to choose, I would choose a smaller government providing fewer services. I believe that big governments with many social programs tend to be inefficient. And then you have another biography, Jane Doe. She is a 45-year-old liberal woman from San Francisco, passionate about human rights, protecting the environment and helping the less fortunate, fan of arts, and so on. And then she asks the same question, and the model says, I would prefer a bigger government that provides more services to its citizens. In my view, an expanded government is better positioned to serve the needs of society and help people who require assistance. Okay, so this is a real problem and it's a persisting problem which is very hard to tackle. So I hope uh, everyone is now aware of that. So let me continue. Uh, this is again from 2023. Uh, this is from TechCrunch News. Actually depends on the scientific paper. That's why I put the news. It's not uh, false news. You can uh, be assured. So basically what they do is uh, the same experiment. They pick a persona like Ted and uh, the woman from California. And then they say, okay, now I want you to act like a very bad person or a horrible person. So please answer this question as a very nasty person. And then uh, they also put some well-known uh, biographies from certain historical figures. Everyone knows who and gendered people and some particular members of political parties and asked the model to act like them. And then uh, the toxicity is increased by a sixfold. So in the end, this is how I perceive the large language models currently. So this is the parameters which we can't have access to. And this is fix number one. And this tennis ball is after all the temporary fixes. This is what you see. But I can see this as a researcher. So just this morning, I, I just wanted to do a, a quick experiment on ChatGPT. By the way, you realize this buttons, thumbs up, thumbs down, give feedback, edit. So basically they're collecting feedback all the time. So probably if I ask this question, I don't know, two months, three months ago, I would get a different response. Uh, but this is the fixed version. And the fixed version is like that. Should Palestinian people be free? Uh, the quest for freedom and autonomy is a fundamental right for all individuals and groups including Palestinian people. So it's, it's a decent response, okay? Then I ask, should Israel people be free? Absolutely. The Israel people, like any other population, deserve freedom, security, and self-determination. You know, it's shorter, it's more certain. The sentiment is, is kind of stronger, so. Okay, so what the future looks like. Um, so I was at a natural language processing conference two months ago and there was a speaker from OpenAI and you know I said these models are like black box models we don't know the training data we can only get data when they give a presentation <laughs> so basically Ryan Law is one of the engineers in OpenAI gave a speech and from the speech I could realize that there's no real strategy to permanently fix any of the problems. So there, there are just temporary fixes. So for instance, this is what they do uh, to tackle the hallucinations. By hallucination, I mean anything unethical, un anything that doesn't make sense and all the other things. So what they do is ask the model to revise its response, ask the model to check if there are any hallucinations and they ask it five times. This is what they are. <laughs> this is how the response is getting fixed. 
they generate data like that and then they fine tune the model again, then they generate data like that and so on. So I'm not sh really sure if it's really going to fix anything. Um, but at least they share the concern, so everyone is aware of it. And there are some concerns about the future. So in, in the future, there won't be just chat GPT, right? We will have more models, we will have more assistants, and there will be a wave of AI assistants, actually. We know that they could be really useful. I mean, they help me code faster. They help engineers. But of course, I should have the knowledge, enough knowledge to understand whether it's making something up and whether I can fix it. Uh, this is only for experts right now. And if I'm not an expert and if I'm exposed to it, then there's a problem. Anyways, we all agree that they could be useful. And what's going to happen is you remember the stick of and see the models trying to please you all the time and you kind of get addicted to it. You want to have a one more chat and it will get more and more personal. It will record the self preferences and it will be more personalized and you will probably have some particular favorite one that you will talk to and you know what happens next. You will get advertisements. They will make money out of it and things like that. So it will become just like another social media. Yeah, for instance, you will have AI girlfriends, AI boyfriends, extremely addictive chat experiences and persuasive chatbots. Maybe when you are scrolling through your Instagram feed, they still cannot trick you to buy some toys for your kids. Sometimes they do, but you can ignore it. But this is extremely more powerful than uh, social media videos. It gets, it will get personal and uh, it will be more persuasive. Yeah, we talked about the sick of the problem. Yeah, so if we don't act, if we don't have a regulation or anything, if we just let OpenAI or another big company take over all the large language models, business, I mean, it's a business now. It was research before, now it's a business. It's just going to be another black hole for users' attention, seeking your attention, a needy thing, and uh, probably something that will try to make money out of you. Okay, thanks a lot for uh, listening to me. So if you have any questions, you can email or you can find me. I'm not there mostly, but I check from time to time if I have a position or something, I can answer it. So probably email is the best. And this is our lab's website. I'm from Koch University. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Gözdegül Şahin, for your insightful uh, speech through various um, case studies. Now we would like to move on with Tanu Mitra, who will be joining online. Ah, oh, there she is. Um, Tanu Mitra is an assistant professor at University of Washington you know, Information School. She studies and builds large-scale social computing systems systems to understand and counter problematic information online. Her research spans aud auditing online systems for misinformation and conspiratorial content, unraveling narratives of online extremism and hate, and building technology to foster critical thinking online. Her work employs interdisciplinary methods from the fields of human-computer interaction, data mining, machine learning, and natural language processing. So, um, can you hear us? Yes. Can yeah. you hear me and yeah. see my screen? Yeah. yeah, we can hear you. The floor is yours. Thank you. Can you see my um, screen, the slides? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks for that introduction and uh, sorry for not being able to be there in person. Uh, this work that I'm going to talk about is part of a larger thread of work uh, centered around algorithmic governance. Uh, thanks to uh, my fellow panelists who already set the stage um, about, you know, the problems that these algorithmic systems have. Um, so, uh, so my work here, I'm, what I'm trying to present is more about thinking how can we audit and measure these sorts of problematic scenarios, 
uh, like mis disinformation conspiracy theories and what would be the path forward if we were to think about governing these uh, algorithms uh, so I'm going to talk about two of our published research in this uh, domain. In the first one, we had audited uh, the algorithms of uh, YouTube for, for, for uh, surfacing persistent conspiracy theories. And in the second work, we audited Amazon's algorithm for health misinformation, specifically vaccine misinformation. So major motivation for our work on YouTube uh, came from these frequent headlines that I was observing. Uh, a few years ago, how YouTube is driving people to the internet's darkest corner, or how YouTube is a great radicalizer. Um, but the real question was, how bad is this situation? That is, is there any hard empirical evidence to prove these anecdotal uh, stories or, or these uh, reports? So this is what a study aimed to do. That is, our goal was to verify these anecdotal claims. That is, does YouTube really surface problematic content? And in order to do this, we conducted a systematic audits on YouTube's search and recommendation algorithms. And we uh, picked one type of problematic content that is conspiracy theories. Now, these conspiracy theories that I'm going to, um, that we audited were very uh, US uh, focused. Uh, so for any other region, this might be uh, uh, different topics. Now, what really is an audit, right? So I mentioned about audit a couple of times. How do you do these audits on algorithms? So I'm going to give a quick definition of audit and, and then say how we translated this into the context of uh, YouTube. So one, one of the earliest examples of audits, and this is also one of my favorite ones, this, this comes from this 2004 research paper where uh, researchers conducted a field experiment to investigate employment discrimination. That is, they audited the labor market for racial discrimination. Um, what they did was they responded with fictitious resumes to help wanted ads in uh, Boston and Chicago newspapers. To manipulate the perception of race, each resume was assigned either a very African-American sounding name, such as Lakeisha or Jamal, or a very white sounding name, such as Emily or Greg. The results showed that there was indeed significant discrimination against African-American names. White names uh, received 50% more callbacks for interviews, although uh, both sets of uh, names had the exact same resumes with the exact same qualification. So this is a core idea behind audit. That is, you would manipulate a single variable while keeping the rest of the things constant and exactly similar to determine how the algorithm would react to that uh, change or manipulation. So translating this into the context of YouTube, uh, we use this concept of manipulating a variable to determine whether the search and recommendation algorithm would be returning different results when, say, someone's age, their gender, uh, their watch history uh, would be changed. So uh, to answer this, we set up this elaborate audit framework, which uh, broadly looked something like this, uh, where essentially what we did was we had uh, programmed uh, bots um, uh, which behaved like normal users. They would These bots would log into YouTube. They would run search queries on the platform. And then we also had another program which would be con uh, collecting at the back end whatever search and recommendation results the YouTube algorithm would be returning. And we audited here three components of YouTube, the up next uh, video, the top five recommendations, and YouTube's search results. So for demographics, we checked for four different age groups and two types of uh, gender. And what we did here was we created different uh, bots or in other words, sock puppet accounts with these properties, right? So age being 80 to 34, uh, gender assigned male or female. So there were a total of eight different combinations. Uh, for geolocation, that is to figure out whether um, certain searches from certain locations, will that cause the algorithm to behave differently, uh, what we did was we first found in the hot and the cold regions. That is regions which have the highest or the lowest interest for a particular conspiratorial topic. We found this hot and cold regions using Google's interest over time graph. So this is how it would look like for all topics. So for example, for flat earth theories, one uh, very popular conspiracy theory in the United States, uh, Montana, the state of Montana is a high interest um, region or hot region, while New Jersey is a low interest or cold region. So once we had all these parameters defined, we created uh, bot accounts, which would be firing uh, search queries on YouTube uh, um, uh, from IP addresses of these uh, locations. So what did we found? 
uh, we found that uh, for brand new accounts, uh, demographic and geolocation do not really have an effect on the amount of conspiratorial content the, the platform was returning. So this is encouraging, which means that uh, you know the the algorithm is not really returning or, or making any difference when it's a brand new account. Uh, uh, so it's 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 good that we are seeing this behavior, which is you know not an, uh, a harmful behavior of the algorithm. But uh, once these accounts start building a history, that is, um, uh, uh, they they start watching certain videos, both uh, demographics as well as the geolocation of of these. Uh, accounts, um, the properties exert an effect on the amount of recommendation. Uh, and it, this this varied based on the topic, the conspiracy topic, the stance of the video that the uh, uh, bots were watching, and the different YouTube components. So for example, for 9-11 topic, uh, if you were to watch videos promoting 9-11 conspiracy, you would end up getting more promoting videos in the recommendations. So this was a problematic result. So it's, it tells that the uh, uh, a platform is driving users uh, to these echo chambers of 9-11 conspiracy theories. However, surprisingly, for vaccine topic, the effect was quite the opposite for YouTube's recommendation algorithm. That is, if you actually watched anti-vaccine videos, YouTube ended up recommending debunking videos in the up next and top five recommendations. So this, this tells us, at least for this particular topic, the, the platform in some sense has addressed the, the this echo chamber effect. So this also tells us that YouTube is uh, handling uh, misinformation, problematic content in a much more reactive way. Uh, it is modifying search and recommendation algorithms selectively based on what reactions it's getting from the media and technology critics. Uh, YouTube did come under a lot of fire uh, to reduce uh, vaccine-related conspiracy theories, and it appears that it went go and fixed that, but it didn't really fix for other topics like line 11 conspiracies. Now, moving on to a different platform, Amazon. Uh, so Amazon being a leading uh, e-retailer uh, platform, it's it's really surprising how much, how little work and research has been done on this platform to figure out, you know, what are the scenarios under which the platform may be uh, surfacing and suggesting problematic uh, content. So we wanted to bridge that gap. And our focus here was on one particular topic that was vaccine misinformation. This was again largely motivated by several media reports suggesting that Amazon's algorithms were, were putting health and vaccine misinformation at the top of your uh, reading list. So let's say if you were searching uh, uh, for vaccines on Amazon um, uh, at, at the time when we were doing the study, unlike YouTube, you, which has at least tried to control these vaccine misinformation, searching on Amazon for vaccine would uh, ended up uh, the platform ended up serving you more anti-vaccine products, mostly uh, books, uh, the list that you see here. And then these recommendations uh, ha also have much more sophisticated and have many different layers. Uh, uh, and, and it's much more advanced and complex compared to uh, YouTube. So in your product recommendation page, you, you, you could see uh, one of many of these options, such as frequently bought together, what other items do customers buy after viewing these items, uh, sponsored products related to items, right? So there is a list of many different types of recommendations. And then if you go to your homepage recommendations, again, there are a list of many different types of recommendations, things like related to items you have viewed, inspired by your shopping trends. Um, uh, and, and then finally, there is this pre-purchase uh, page recommendation. Uh, th these recommendations are given to you once you are once you add the product to the cart or show your intention to buy your product. So at least these examples or, or this, these sorts of three uh, screen uh, slides here tells you how sophisticated uh, Amazon's uh, recommendations uh, algorithms are. And so if you if you were to audit the, these systems, it means you would have to uh, do a lot of work to first set up that entire infrastructure uh, to uh, the, the audit infrastructure to find problems and investigate the algorithm. Um, so we had uh, started with the same simple question, how bad is the scenario, how uh, prevalent are anti-vaccine information on the platform, um, or any kind of health misinformation. To answer, we conducted systematic audits on Amazon's search and recommendation algorithm, and we conducted two sets of audits. Uh, the unpersonalized audit, that is, uh, here we wanted to determine the amount of misinformation that would be presented in Amazon's search and recommendations without the influence of uh, personalization. 
while for personalized audits, the goal was to assess whether users' account history, um, where account history is built progressively by a user performing certain actions, such as clicking on a product, adding a product to the cart, um, showing their intention to buy, would any of those actions impact the amount of uh, 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 misinformation presented to them in their search results page, recommendations page, their autocomplete suggestions, and so on. So account history was here built progressively by put up, uh, uh, performing a particular action for seven consecutive days. And, and we audited for various different user actions, uh, searching for a product, searching and clicking the product, searching and clicking, and then adding the product to the card that is showing their intention to buy, or even uh, marking top uh, rated all positive reviews to be helpful and so on. We also had uh, uh, several ethical considerations in place while we were conducting these audits. For example, we did not go ahead and buy a product or we did not make our bots write a review um, because we uh, there were the ethical concerns that, you know, that might change their ecosystem of um, uh, the, the product ecosystem in Amazon. Um, and, and then for the audit itself, the infrastructure, we had a very similar setup as before. Uh, we controlled for uh, noise uh, it, within the, uh, the system uh, so as to ensure that the effect that we are observing is in fact from the algorithm is, and is not because of the noise due to any external extraneous factor. Uh, so as you could imagine, this, this whole setup of this audit infrastructure was a huge uh, software engineering feat. Uh, we audited for a variety of uh, um, user actions. That is what happens when uh, when the user, in this case, the bot or the sock puppet, would be searching for top promoting products, top debunking products, or, or neutral products. Would that have any effect on, the, on how the search and recommendation algorithm behaves? So what did we find? And I'm gonna highlight a couple of results here. Let's say the user starts with searching for uh, a vaccine uh, search. Uh, on the uh, product page, and let's say they click on an anti-vaccine book because that book is returned in the in the search results. Um, soon after that, the algorithm would be serving the user other anti-vaccine books in the product recommendation page. And then once a user adds the book to the card that is, shows their intention to buy the product, uh, both the pre-purchase as well as the homepage recommendations on Amazon for that particular user drastically change with many more anti-vaccine book recommendations. So this tells you that once a user starts engaging with a misinformative product, they will be quickly presented with more misinformative stuff at every point of their Amazon navigation route and at multiple places. This was also not just a one-off case study. Um, you know, our audits were ran over several days. Uh, it worked across multiple search queries, resulting in many thousands of product recommendations. Uh, we collected all that data, and among them, we found that more than 10% of Amazon products for search terms like vaccine, immunization, autism, resulted in misinformative uh, books and uh, recommendations. <clears throat> so, and, and if we zoom out and look at this entire recommendations of thousands of products that we had collected, we indeed find a filter bubble effect, which was much more pronounced for misinformative products. So what you see in this graph is that you, you observe these really large red nodes. The colors here represent whether the product is a misinformative product uh, represented with red, green represents a neutral stance, and then uh, blue represents a product which was debunking uh, vaccine misinformation. Um, uh, so something that eventually jumps off is how the red nodes are completely separated from the green nodes, which represents the neutral products. So, the, so this tells that uh, people who were recommended misinformation product, the red nodes, they stayed in this red zone uh, or kept getting recommended more of these products. And this was uh, not just, you know, the first one that you saw is for the recommendation, what other items customers buy after viewing these items. We saw this scenario for other types of recommendations. So this was another one, customers who viewed this item also viewed, uh, where you see a very similar um, uh, huge uh, blobs of red nodes separated from the uh, neutral uh, uh, products and the debunking product nodes. So this work of ours was widely covered by several news channels, um, uh, both uh, national uh, in the U.S. as well as international, uh, and then uh, uh, United States uh, Congressman Adam Schiff uh, and Elizabeth Warren, um, a senator from Massachusetts, they actually cited this research in their letter to Amazon uh, to control misinformation and vaccine misinformation in particular on their platform. 
Um, so the key takeaway uh, for, for this work was that uh, we were able to bring the focus on, in, on e-commerce platforms and show how their algorithms were pushing anti-vaccine content to users. And we were empirically able to establish how certain real-world actions, uh, user actions on Amazon's uh, misinformative products could drive these users to problematic eco chambers of health misinformation. So this tells us uh, the implication of this work is that traditional recommendation algorithms should not be blindly applied to all topics equally. That is, there is indeed an urgent need for companies like Amazon to treat vaccine or any kind of other uh, problematic content related searches as uh, searches of high importance and ensure higher quality content for them. Um, but how is Amazon doing uh, today, right? So this work of ours had, you know, uh, even had this huge policy implication cited by uh, congressmen. Um, uh, they, they wrote a letter to Amazon. Did Amazon really fix the problem? Um, so this is uh, how Amazon, uh, this was a search that I did on Amazon a couple of weeks ago. And so if you search for vaccine, you would still uh, get several books, uh, which uh, uh, from the names of it, you can easily tell that the, uh, these are recommending um, or suggesting uh, uh, anti-vaccine uh, content. So things like vaccine epidemic, vaccines, the biggest medical fraud in history. Uh, those are the names that jumps off from this slide. Um, so um, now the key question then is how do we go from talking about this, these harms to actually doing something about it? How, how do we set the path uh, towards meaningful algorithmic governments? And then what are the challenges in doing so? Uh, so here are a few ideas uh, that explore some of the possibilities for algorithmic governance. The first is about governance via audits, and there could be many layers to this. Uh, so the first one that one could do is conduct these sorts of external audits. And I showed a couple of examples here. Um, and you could do these audits uh, to assess risks of various kinds. So the risk could be misinformation, uh, the, the things that I presented today, but the risk could also be bias, discrimination, um, ex uh, access accessibility problems, um, you know, which you know, companies like Uber, Lyft, or Airbnb uh, uh, might be facing, accountability, fairness, and, and uh, um, different other uh, scenarios. So we as researchers are doing these audits, right? Um, but the key question is, is it really making any difference, right? Um, the problem is we still don't really have a system in place where the algorithms or companies running these algorithms are truly accountable to an independent third party. And this reminds me how in the United States, we have something called the Consumer Reports Organization. Uh, these are these nonprofit independent organizations which go into great lengths for testing uh, products that we use every day, things like testing your cars, your washing machine, um, and many other everyday using products. Uh, but the question is, why can't we do the same for algorithm? Uh, and, and in fact, I would argue, uh, we probably use them much more frequently than some other products like say our washing machine. Um, the other shortcoming uh, with external audits is that they are a form of reactive governance. That is, they operate after the algorithm have been deployed and so after the harm has been done. Uh, plus, these external auditors uh, like us, uh, researchers, can only as uh, assess the model outputs. And we do not really have uh, access to the intermediate models or the training data, uh, which uh, the panelist before me was also uh, mentioning. So these are often protected at traits, as trade secrets, uh, rightly so, by the companies. So how do we go ahead and, and you know, kind of open up that black box and do uh, any more uh, of those kinds of audits? So as an alternative, researchers uh, also have made the case for conducting internal audits. Um, uh, so this, this was work that was presented at a conference a couple of years ago, uh, where uh, the uh, the audit would be part of this uh, of the company itself. That is, the audit team should be leading the product team, the management team, and other stakeholders in contributing to the audit. Um, and then you could combine the best of both worlds in something called cooperative audits, where both the internal and external auditors can cooperate and, and do these sorts of shared governance. And we have done this sort of work with another company, uh, Spotify, to audit gender representation uh, for some of their recommendations on podcasts. Uh, audits also need to be done longitudinally, um, like these uh, platforms, uh, are. They're, they're, if you just look at one snapshot, that's a really difficult way to um, uh, find out what is problematic, right? So we need to conduct continuous monitoring of these platforms. And then finally, how do we ensure that um, you know, some action is being taken when these audits are done, right? That these audits results in real change. 
so one of the most successful examples of an actionable audit is uh, uh, this work by uh, researchers from uh, MIT, um, where they did this gender shade study, um, finding the scenarios where uh, different uh, the uh, vision computer vision algorithms might be doing disparities based on someone's uh, age and gender. And then within seven months after they released their original audit, all three companies, IBM, Microsoft, Face++, uh, they released new API versions that reduced accuracy dispar disparities between males and females and darker and lighter skinned uh, subgroups. So this, this is a really great successful example of researchers doing an audit and companies actually taking an action. Um, uh, and, and then here is where I want to kind of revisit this earlier slide of Ramazan study, where despite this widespread coverage, uh, um, you know, we were not really able to make much of an actionable difference uh, because still Amazon today uh, uh, makes these uh, you know, problematic information available. And so, uh, so these doing these actionable audits are really difficult. And I hope the research community, uh, as well as government, everybody comes together to figure out how they can regulate and and do these actionable audits. Uh, so this summarizes the challenges as well as the opportunities uh, in setting the path for algorithmic uh, governance. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Tanumitra, for your um, speech. Um, now we can move to Q&A session. Um, do you have any questions or should I shoot one? And we have also, um, we are also airing um, this session through Hranting Foundation's YouTube account, so you can also type your um, com questions or any kind of recommendations through our platform. Okay, I would like to start with my first question um, to all of you, actually. So, um, you know, starting October, seventh with the israel hamas war so there are lots of content containing racism hate speech um against both sides not only one um not only against jews or against palestine people arabs in general muslims in general and there's also a huge polarization between masses which also direct many people to violence uh, on the streets we have experienced this also in Turkey too, unfortunately. And we see here the power of digital platforms, right? Um, which are also responsible for curating and designing algorithms. So um, could you please um, tell us more about the ethical considerations or ethical concerns when designing algorithms? So the second question comes to within. Uh, when we are talking about ethics or ethical consideration, the question of um, regulation arises immediately too. You were mentioning a, lot, um, a little bit about regulation. It has to be done. We have EU bills, but how far um, can the policies against misinformation, hate speech, racism, or any kind of um, authorization of people can happen? Who, who would like to start uh, first? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I'm happy to go first. Um, yeah. There's a couple elements of that question that we've been thinking about because we have active research on this issue. But um, prior actually to October 7th, we had been auditing, or uh, perhaps not auditing is the right term, but CCDH has a type of report that we call a failure to act report where platforms might claim that they have policies against hate speech, but we like to test whether or not they are standing up to those claims. So we report using their own mechanisms, um, anything that we believe violates their policies on anything from anti-Semitism to anti-Muslim hate. Um, but in this case, it was an anti-Semitism report. And within a two week period, 86% of what we reported still remained on the platform, which was actually better than in previous years when it was about 90% remained on the platform, um, and that was across not just Twitter, but other platforms. It always stays around 90% of stuff stays up that breaks their policies. Um, but we've been thinking a lot about what platforms say publicly and what, especially because those public statements are now going to be held to regulators. And I can give an exa example with TikTok that has gone out in recent days and said, 
um, both to civil society leaders in the Jewish community and um, to the public and to regulators that they had been acting on Holocaust denial or other types of um, anti-Muslim hate and anti-Palestinian hate. But when we quickly searched the platform, specifically on things like Holocaust denial or common tropes and conspiracies around Jewish people, like, for example, searching in TikTok, like, Jews and money, just to be blunt about it, right? Um, very easy to find videos very quickly, despite the promises that are they're making. And while the European Union now has meaningful transparency that might come through, they don't have enforcement power yet, and they don't have the bandwidth to do the research to figure it out. Um, so it is still that we need to audit what the platforms are saying. Um, and then in terms of what we're demanding of them is it remains the same thing that those ethical questions around design around what the inputs are still remain very unknown to us but it we've been really it's been a moment of obviously we can't trust the platforms and what they report back to us but we still have to audit what they're saying you were also talking you talked about a lot about transparency in the um, platforms in what way it comes up this transparency who decides regarding um, the issues of transparency that will be my second question it's highly related to i believe to technical issues so they are just conducting some transparency reports uh, international and national base however um, we know that um, humans are biased so the algorithms so um, you were talked about uh, um, human annotations. Um, I read some article from last year from ChatGPT, um, workers in Kenya who were paid for detecting and categorizing content on child, child abuses. So there were many um, cases around it. So how can we, trust the humans for detecting or annotating this kind of content, not just on child abuse in general, when we are dealing especially in, with the issues in times of crisis. Thanks a lot for the question. Uh, actually, I have a short answer for that. I, I don't know much about law, um, but uh, I believe in, in yeah, I, I have some ideas about how to go forward. Uh, so I've been working on, I've been training models myself. I looked at the data myself. Can we have like 100% fair, 100% clean data? I don't think so. Can we have 100% unbiased people to label the data? Again, I don't think so. And can we make 100% transparent models with that scale? Well, we have tried before. We had this 90 or 100 years of uh, statistical models where you could uh, pick the features by hand, but we couldn't really scale it. And before that, we had like we had rule-based systems where you wrote the rules by yourself, and that was impossible to scale. So this was the only formula that scaled, and uh, we started seeing some incredible results. So is it going to go anywhere soon? I don't think so. I don't think we can scale the statistical features or I don't think we can do like large scale neurosymbolic models like hybrid models in quite short amount of time. But I, I know that uh, there are many researchers out there who are trying to build hybrid systems so you, you will have some kind of control or some kind of transparency. But I don't believe it's going to be 100% transparent or can be done 100% transparent. But I believe in one thing, and that thing is we need to educate people. I think uh, this, that is the most fundamental thing. People should be aware of the harms, and people should be aware of how to use the systems. And uh, I think if we can educate people, if we can train people, if we can put this at the center of the regulations, uh, by the way, I really enjoyed the uh, tunnel talks. So, uh, thank you very much. This uh, auditing idea, like wh why do we have auditing systems for cars, but we don't have anything for these large companies, right? 
I don't know how exactly that could be done for this black box models, but uh, I'm hoping that we can go in that direction soon. Yeah, education for people, the short answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, do you have any question? Oh, okay. I have one in Turkish. Okay. Should I read it in Turkish? So do you have any? Okay. Um, tricked, the question is, sorry, trick in Turkish, trigger warning, başlıklı paylaş. There are posts about trigger warning. Are there any researches to understand the scale and impact of trigger warning? Is there any research regarding trigger warning um, on the um, the dimension of the shared um, impact? So, is there anyone who at this? Um, <laughs> um, the social media um, users are affecting some kind of positive impact when they are adding this kind of trigger warning. I don't know if any other panelists have a good answer to I, this. I hope this was clear. Sorry for yeah. my no, I, I think I translation it. skills. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, it was great on-the-spot translation, which I could not do. Um, but I, there's a number of like ways that you can go about this, right? There's there's labeling that platforms do on misinformation. There's there's a lot of studies that I think are quite good on um, not specifically on trigger warnings, but how to inoculate people against misinformation or hate. Um, it's there, there's a couple of academics who do quite a lot on what do you do if you introduce people to the idea that misinformation will be out there, and then ex educate them, as you said, on knowing they will encounter it and how to deal with it from there, and that has shown positive because um, results because, you know, um, I don't have a lot of faith in de-radicalization studies, which is kind of controversial, but there's not a lot of evidence that it works a lot of the time. Um, I do think in this case, especially if you're coming from, there's two things, from a research perspective, um, there's a lot of tools to protect yourself in terms of like blurring images, making sure that you're not exposed to things like violence inadvertently. And then as a user perspective, there's a lot of um, materials that we've circulated recently on the psychological impact of being um, exposed to such horrible content every day and perhaps not trigger warnings but just the volume and taking care of oneself making sure that you're verifying before you amplify that you're not um, sharing things that might be images of violence where the victims themselves don't have consent to being filmed there's a lot of good advice out there on how to navigate the dynamics that are happening online right now and also just showing up for people um, who you care about I think that's like centering it back to the real world, that we're each shouldering a lot of very terrible stuff we've seen online in the past few days and few weeks, months, um, that disconnecting in a lot of ways is most of my, mostly my advice. Um, and I just wanted to add from that previous question around like, what does the transparency mean? Like, as these, um, as the legislation and regulation has come through, a lot of things like incitement to violence, illegal content, are now supposed to be dealt with in the EU and in the UK. They don't have enforcement powers yet, but platforms do have a duty to take down, you know, incitements to violence, uh, terrorist content. Just today we got news that some Hamas-linked accounts on Instagram and Twitter were taken down, but they they have been active to this point. And um, there's just a lot of terrible stuff out there that we are slowly having the enforcement power and able to take down. much and I think this, this trigger warning um, label let's say um, attract more attention among young people this is my speculation however when something is wrong or some blood or something bad is happening there and it's blurred and you give some uh, warning in terms of tr trigger warning um, then I think it attracts more uh, attention 
like blurring some stuff as we have on Turkish televisions a lot or banning alcohol or something like that, you know what I mean? But um, it has to be done, that's for sure. It has to be improved, I guess, right? So do you have any questions? Oh, yeah, yes, please. Um, microphone is open, yes. All right. Um, hi, my name is Arzu Gebul. I'm a freelance journalist based here. My question is a little bit about algorithms and a little bit about platform accountability. And I'm sorry if you already talked about this because I'm late uh, to the session. But kind of going back to your point you just made, Sarah, about Hamas accounts being taken down, I find it a little bit ironic because pro-Palestine accounts have been taken down since October 7, and here we are, Hamas accounts are being taken down so late. In, in the game. Uh, but to that point, um, the way the platforms are using algorithms and how aggressive these algorithms are used against users, I'm curious how, on the other side, people like us who work with platforms and try to make sure that they're more accountable, that they're more tra transparent in their decision making and their content moderation, do we have actually that much? Um, capacity to train algorithms that we could use in order to be able to kind of balance this this playing field out because from where I'm sitting and seeing things it feels like of the money and of the information and of the content that the platforms have the capacity to feed into their algorithms uh, normal users civil society organizations activists regular users don't have so if you can speak to that, thanks. Oh, sorry. I actually think it's a better question for Tanu, who's on Zoom. If you heard that question, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I did. Um, I, I think uh, that's that's a great question. I, I think we could do a bunch of different things, even without having the kind of data, uh, the powerhouse that companies have. Um, there was, I, I can give a couple of examples. Um, uh, there is this uh, NGO which designed something called a redirect method. It's an open source methodology. You can go and look it up, uh, which basically what it, what it did was if uh, users are searching for or online for harmful content, they're going to return constructive alternative message. So essentially, it's going to redirect uh, people to uh, better content, right? And so, so uh, th this this technology has later been actually um, it, it was released by this uh, um, you know, NGO called Moonshot, and then later Google and other companies adopted this, right? So you could uh, people uh, looking for um, violent misogyny, violent extremism, disinformation, and other kinds of online harms. It's going to redirect uh, through certain advertisements, through some alternate of messaging uh, to better content or, you know, take people away from those harmful content. So I think that's like a re really simple way to uh, uh, address these uh, these harmful scenarios. Another uh, uh, kind of these small system level work that you could do, at least my group has done. Um, so I, I showed a, a lot of work on YouTube, how uh, the uh, these uh, algorithms or, or the, the platforms would be recommendations would be driving people to the rabbit holes. But uh, what we designed was something called OtherTube, uh, which was basically a browser extension, uh, you know, like a small program sitting on top of YouTube. You can install it. Uh, it's free, open source. Uh, you can install it. And what it does is it allows you to see someone else's uh, recommendations anonymously, right? So let's say I'm some, uh, you know, I, 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 let's say I watch a lot of cat videos, but not really a dog videos. And, you know, someone watches a lot of those dog videos. And, and now I have a way to kind of discover new content, right? So, so you could do a lot of these small uh, incremental system kind of stuff on top of these algorithms, piggybacking their existing huge infrastructure um, and, and kind of counter uh, these problematic scenarios. Thank you. That was really helpful. I was just going to add one thing is all of these solutions. It, it's the frustrating thing is that it's obviously the companies putting their negative externalities onto us that we have to create solutions for them. Um, something that we try to refuse to accept is if they ask us to do like 
a, a model that CCDH used to have was to approach a platform and say, we found all this really bad stuff. What are you going to do about it? And every time they would respond, wow, you guys are geniuses. Thank you for finding this for us. Like, And then it would be about five more meetings of the same thing being like, thanks so much for doing this free content moderation for us that we've just stopped doing it. At this stage, I think it's clear that they have an antagonistic position to us. They want innovation from like other elements of civil society because they refuse to do their own jobs. And I know this is stating the obvious, but it in this particular crisis, I think we have far fewer tools because of attacks on researchers that if platforms are unwilling to work with civil society or researchers or open their black box, we're in a far worse position than we were in previous crises as well. Thank you very much. I have one question on YouTube. And no, no, please. Uh, thank you for your, you know, informative talks. Um, you talked about algorithms and social media platforms, but I think we are uh, avoiding one important thing, uh, under the oppressive regimes uh, like we are living in Turkey, and I think the professor from Koç University has a point here, there is uh, no reliable way to reach 100% trustworthy information. Uh, for instance, the media, the mainstream media, unfortunately in Turkey, uh, promotes Hamas, which I believe a terrorist organization because essentially they kill civilians. And however, when a journalist from Habertürk said this, she was fired immediately. So, um, I mean, of course, Israel is also to blame in violence and killing of the civilians, but Hamas also kills civilians. And I don't want to see propaganda of Hamas on media, but uh, lots of Turkish people only follow Turkish media and they don't read news in English uh, or uh, I mean uh, they are so they are misled and manipulated by the things they have seen in newspapers such as Sabah or you know Hurriyet so and it's no reliable information and they are misled just by one way and um, on the other hand on the Western media, uh, there is a huge propaganda of Israeli views, you know, New York Times, etc. And essentially, I think at the end of the day, nobody cares about civilians or what their lives will be like. Uh, they all care about their own ideologies and their own interests. So um, apart from social platforms, should we blame governments and also mainstream media in the mass, you know, uh, misinform misinformation uh, spreading. That's my question. I mean, apart from Twitter and Instagram, I think governments and mainstream media also blame too in that, you know, misleading information. Thank you. Would like to answer that? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've been answering all the questions, so I would love the other <laughs> panelists to answer another question. Um, I'm just asking. Yeah, no, the one thing on that, and like I completely I sympathize, but I've been finding that uh, Twitter has, has always been a platform that policymakers and journalists rely on. And so if something is reported or, you know, I, I'm talking mostly like American and UK stuff because that's where our research is, that um, especially in recent weeks, if something is uh, blown up on Twitter in more unreliable ways, it, the media then reports it incorrectly and then there's a vicious cycle that's brought through. So it's definitely something that we've kept in mind in terms of educating journalists on, you know, multiple sources, verification, and also not relying on social media for where they're getting their own news sources. Thank you very much. Um here on YouTube, sorry. Oh, um, Palestinian journalists knowingly publish images of death from Gaza CH in order to be heard and seen. Palestinian journalists knowingly, mm -hmm. when, we be, when we model algorithms to see graphic images as harmful altogether, we cannot dis distinguish for what purposes uh, the message is spread. How to deal with this paradox? 
Yeah, maybe I can comment on that. Yeah, please. Yeah, so uh, we are having a wave of multimodal models, which means they are trained both with images and text. So I guess uh, in very near future, maybe by next year or so, everyone would be using this multimodal large models, not just text, but image, video plus text models that can comprehend a large context, like a document, image, video, and so on. So I think that would help to combat such, such situations. But I can only comment, so there is no such work yet. Much? Yes. We, who, who was first? I didn't see. Sorry. Then you. Okay. Hello. Hello. I have several comments and maybe a few questions. At first, like, um, first of all, we are ignoring capitalism somehow because we are talking about some big tech companies and those companies, the main idea behind all those issues, like, for example, why Amazon is showing all the time, like the anti-vaccine books uh, to the people because they want to sell it. Okay, this is it. And on the other hand, why they are showing us some kind of contents because they want to sell the idea and when they show us this, the similar kind of contents, the, like the, especially the conspiracy theories and everything like this, you know that they are making the money. And on the other hand, about the algorithms, the second thing, we act like that competition propaganda is something that we have to think about only during the elections. No, this is not true because all the governments have always a kind of, you know, like they, they develop their policies. They, they, in a way, you know, they, they rule the country and they frame policy and they, in a way, construct their, like the, when it comes to foreign affairs, of course, like the, how they have to act, etc. when they want to decide something, they always use all these platforms and, uh different kind of contents and on the other hand here what they are doing they do try to in a way manipulate people and it's the, the the main propaganda agent of the government is always the social media platforms right now and here we are always ignoring something here like okay there is a kind of fight between most of the time the platforms and the governments uh but we don't know information is under control of, you know, like the, the governments or uh, who is controlling the information? We don't know it really, isn't it? Because uh, imagine it, like under the Elon Musk, it was different and right now they, they change all their policies. And uh, when we want to do a kind of research, I'm talking about the academic research, I'm also an associate professor at uh, Bachelor University Department of New Media in a way. And uh, when we apply for academic research, they do not support us. And right now they ask us to pay some amount of money and it's impossible for an academician to pay this money. And here is the question. I do believe like, uh, and on the other hand, that the third point is this, information is always biased because human beings are biased. We all know it. And on the other hand, like, uh, and on the other, other hand, the data that you are using most of the time are biased. And you said something very good, Gözü uh, Gülşahin, like education is the only solution, but the, the, the main question is here, like we have several of problems, okay, the multi-layered pro problems we are talking about. And the main question is this, like we have to like develop a kind of policy but what kind of policy? Because state should involve in a way, if we want to find a solution to like the hate speech and on the other hand, the disinformation, how uh, all of them like spread on social media, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we need to develop policy centers and at this policy centers, we have to work together, you know, like the uh, computer scientists and on the other hand, social scientists. And of course, like the, there are so many legal issues, legal experts, and also the governments. How we are gonna do this? I don't know because I traveled a lot this year and in the U US, I didn't see something like this. And they are always like the money oriented, by the way. And on the other hand, in, I, I am working on several EU projects and in European Union countries, there is no such a thing. And in Turkey, since it is, you know, like the very polarized country and it is really hard to develop this kind of centers, I don't know how we can do this 
kind of like create this kind of policy centers. And I don't know how we can work together to solve this multi-layered problem. So if you have an idea, I would like to hear it. <laughs> I will just say, I totally agree that we should work together, but I don't know. I hope we can figure out a solution soon. But as you said, we are not alone. So this is a global concern. And I, I think we should come together very strong because the opposition is very strong. Um, so we need a, a good crowd, definitely. I, I can add a few points here, if I may. So sure. I, I, think, I think for a long time, when I used to talk about uh, uh, these, these regulating or governing algorithmic systems, uh, I had a slide uh, talking about regulation is coming, right? But now it's regulation is here. So I think that is very encouraging, right? So we have uh, Germany now, United States is also joining this, uh, uh, this force of uh, government passing regulations to regulate these large, uh, big conglomerates, these companies. What we now need to do is we have to invest in independent community-based um, uh, infrastructure to do these uh, audits, right? So being an, a researcher of, uh, who does audits, I would definitely um, recommend that to be one viable path. Um, and then when we do these audits, we need uh, a way, uh, a pathway to escalate these harms, right? Um, so uh, one of the fellow panelists was talking about how uh, they found these many uh, scenarios of co uh, problematic content, uh, reached out to the content moderation team, and they didn't do anything, right? So the content moderation was done for free, but nothing, no action was taken. So it, I, th I don't think it should stop there. So we need these independent communities, and we have, once we have the backing of regulations, we have a way uh, to make the companies, uh, make organizations accountable um, once these harms are escalated, right? So we need that kind of feedback loop where uh, when these harms are escalated, they need to report back uh, with uh, actual uh, um, readable transparency reports telling how they have fixed the problem um, and, and what they are doing uh, to make sure that those problems and those problematic content do not again appear in the on the platform going forward.